people need to vote, but there's so many more things that need to be done. And I think that it's so daunting for people to be like, I'm one individual, like how can I help? It's literally trying to rebuild a country that sets everyone up for success, understanding the historical traumas that people have been through. This is something we're talking about every single day. That does have electoral impact. If something bad is happening in their community, I don't want to say make it happen, but like, make it happen. <laughs> Man, what's up, y'all? I'm Doma T. Pongo, and I'm here at the MTV News studio in New York with four of our country's most inspiring organizers. We're here to have an honest conversation about the state of youth activism and youth civic engagement ahead of the midterms this year. And I feel like every election season, there are like these two competing narratives that come out about young people. It's either that we don't care about politics at all and we live in our own bubble, mm -hmm. or that we are the only hope in addressing <laughs> the world's most pressing issue. Pick a narrative. Oh, exactly, pick a narrative. <laughs> like, let's be consistent. I feel like yeah. there's a little bit of fact and a little bit of cap in both of those narratives, yeah. right? Yep. So I brought you guys here to help me sort through mm -hmm. all of that. And I think we should actually start with what it actually means to be an organizer in 2022. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, it's really just using whatever time, talent you have to move people. I think the folks who are driving carpool or who are organizing the bake sale for a community are doing community organizing. Mm. Honestly, like, I 100% agree. I think that it's just like, anybody can be an organizer, and honestly, everybody is an organizer yeah. in their own way. Like, talking to your family members about the elections going on, about issues going on in the world, talking to your neighbors, having a care for the world, and acting upon that care. Yeah. What issues do you organize around? Um, organize around a lot of issues engaging young people on being the next generation of leaders, right? And even sometimes even the present generation of leadership. Young people, I think, are the most diverse um, demographic that we have and like their issues are so so versed as well too, whether it's the environment, whether it's about student loan debt, whether it's about um, indigenous issues. Young people lead revolutions, right? And so for me, it's about ensuring that young people are set up with the skill sets to lead the next generation forward to make social change. It's for what do you follow on that? For me, I have always wanted to organize because my parents were organized, especially my mother. Um, and so when I had the ability to really engage by myself um, in high school, at 14 I joined my school's environmental club. And I didn't intend to be um, a climate organizer. And honestly, I didn't grow up um, you know, going outside or anything like that. I have immigrant parents. Hiking wasn't really in the picture. Neither was camping. And I kind of just started to realize, like, these kids only cared about water conservation or polar bears. But for me, it was more of, like, <laughs> I care about, like, air quality and asthma rates. The climate crisis is a people crisis. I think about it as a very people-centered framework. And once I learned that, I really delved into it way more. What skill set do you have? Because I think your path is particularly interesting to me. Yeah, it's a little different. I mean, I my issues are sort of wide ranging. Like I do care about a lot of different issues, but I also like have the mindset where like injustice anywhere begets injustice everywhere, right? So all of yep. them are very intrinsically connected. Yep. Um, but my focus personally is using digital technologies to streamline civic engagement, especially mm -hmm. online. And that can look like a lot of different things, like my favorite example being taking down the anti-CRT tip line in Virginia by helping people spam it with song lyrics um, and lines from the B movie. Amazing. Um, that was my, I like that one a lot. I try to use it on a local level as well. Civic engagement in a lot of ways is just hard. It's convoluted. It's something that we're not taught about a lot in schools. Um, and so something as simple as like contacting your local representative to get something done in your town can be this this mystifying process and I really don't want it to be mystified in that way. In 2019 there was a school shooting at my younger sister's school and it became this whole like political battle to get the two students who had died in the shooting memorialized at our Central Park because that was the mm. reunification point for the students after the shooting. And so I like coded something that made it really easy for people to send in comments being like, you should mm. memorialize them, all that stuff. Like you literally and could click a link. Just click. They crafted the email for you. And, and it just sent goes. It off. Yeah. And I think it was like 56 out of the 63 public comments were used using that generator. And then yeah. they ended up being memorialized after that which is like remarkable and I think really shows the possibilities of like namely civic engagement should people have the agency and the knowledge to do what they want to do in their communities. That's amazing. Yeah. All of you guys' work centers on this idea of one making civic engagement easier, right? And demystifying the information around it and access to information. I'm wondering what played into 
the uptick in youth voter turnout that we saw uh, last midterms and even in the last election. One of the changes that we saw is we had many young people across the country running in 2018 who knew that they could not take the youth vote for granted. And we had organizations spring up across the country that were investing money and resources in young leaders across the country. And then people wanted to act like it was a surprise that young people showed up, right? And I'm like, no, no, we made an investment and like years of work went into registering and turning out those young people to vote. I think what we saw was that we have a generation of young people who are sick and tired of seeing tragedy happen and only thoughts and prayers given, right? Like mm -hmm. these are young people who've seen school shooting after school shooting, the planet turned for the worse. We've seen the killing of uh, unarmed black people continuously shown to our face mm -hmm. on social media. And we got to this point that we had COVID, everything explodes, you're put into the house. We see that the failure of school systems to be able to deliver resources to students in, in a, a digital environment. And we had an action point with the election. To add some context around what we're talking about, 50% of young people yep. ages 18 to 29 voted in the 2020 presidential election. It's an 11% increase yep. from, uh, from 2016. It seems like conversations around hot button issues got so impassioned that it mm -hmm. felt like we had to vote. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this trend will continue in the absence of some bombastic voices that we had last election cycle. It's kind of interesting because I could not vote in 2020. I was too young, but- Just crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but however, I do think that it's really interesting because like in a lot of states, like people were auto mailed absentee ballots in 2020, where they like the ballot box was their front door. And I think that that is also another reason as to why it was so much easier for people to access voting in a lot of states, especially leading up to 2024, I think people are engaged. I think it's a little bit harder though when it comes to midterms because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that there's election going on. A lot of people don't know who is on the ballot. And so I think that it's really the job of organizers and those in our local communities to really bring it up. And then I think we can see um, a really large number hit the polls this year. I'll speak for myself in years past, there's always the swath of people like, my vote doesn't count, it doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, it's a broken record. It's been that way for generations. Yeah. Have you guys seen anecdotally in your organizing a change in attitude? I think one of the things I've seen young people and energy really go towards is local change. Federal change has been proven to be really hard, right? And there are a lot of issues that impact that, including gerrymandering, right? That we mm -hmm. see that literally has divided this country into racial boundaries on like who gets to be represented in this country. Mm -hmm. But what I've also seen over the last four years is young people really take home to what they can impact locally. So whether it's like CRT and local school boards, whether it's removing police out of schools, yeah. like there is so much energy happening where young people are like, okay, well, if we can't get the win here federally, because of whatever is happening there. What we know we can do is we can go to our school board meeting on a Thursday night mm -hmm. and tell them we need better education, we need better lunches. Voting is just a tool in the toolbox, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And like, Very important this is about using every tool we have to make a difference and to like dismantle these systems. If we have them showing up in local elections, those first couple of elections of their life, you're creating a lifelong voter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that does more than affect the impact of a midterm. That fundamentally changes the electorate. And that makes it where we have to have much different conversations about our politics. Yeah. One way to determine like the power of a tool is how hard somebody fights to take that tool from you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? They wouldn't be trying to suppress our vote if our vote didn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tactics that are being used to suppress the youth, youth vote? And how do we combat those? Well, I feel like it's just as simple as making voting as convoluted and difficult as possible. <laughs> like, no, right. no, no, truly. It's, it's really true. that simple. Like, for example, there was a Supreme Court case heard and decided on for Pennsylvania saying that if your mail-in ballot does not have the date on it, then it will not be counted. Luckily, I am from California and I feel very privileged to know that, like, I'm able to vote by mail because it is automatically sent to our doorstep. In so many states, like I know in Missouri, for example, it is incredibly difficult to get a mail-in ballot. You have to get an affidavit. The more so people make it hard to access mail-in ballots specifically because so many young people are in college, young voting age people are in college, um, by making that more difficult, they're actively trying to suppress the youth vote. Totally.
Totally. We saw we saw some similar things happening in Texas. Where you're from? Yeah, Texas really ground zero in this like national fight uh, for the freedom to vote over the past couple of years, and we see it as a direct result of that increase in youth voters that we mm -hmm. saw. Right? We have politicians who do not think that they can win with that electorate, so they are trying to make sure that electorate does not exist. Mm -hmm. We saw in the primaries just this year they threw out more than twenty thousand vote by mail applications and ballots, um, limiting early voting. There was an attempt to limit Sunday voting, which we know is very um, a big part of mobilizations for souls to the polls in like African-American black communities in Texas. One, they put up those actual barriers, right? There are legal barriers for many people to vote. But when we talk about people feeling like their vote doesn't matter, that's a result of voter suppression too. Mm -hmm. Convincing people that their voices and their votes and their lived experiences do not matter is a deeply insidious form of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. I take every opportunity I can to tell people about why I'm registered to vote, about why I show up, and by why I believe in democracy, because people are trying to undermine our trust in this whole system. And so it's on us as organizers to try to rebuild that trust too. I'm not gonna lie, just as an everyday voter, when, you, when the pandemic hit, and you saw how easy it was to fill out those absentee ballots, yeah. you didn't realize how hard it was before, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you you had some municipalities where you had to have an excuse in order to even get yeah. an absentee Missouri ballot. Missouri being yeah. one of them, yeah. yeah. Th those things ended up being lifted. When you talk about legislation that's being put in place to suppress the vote, but what are some things that we can do immediately to kind of combat that? What do you think? I think, like, one of the best things that political campaigns I've seen in my hometown is giving people sample ballots, like showing them every single race that's going to be up and down that ballot, but also showing up, coming to their community events, going to um, their restaurants and their coffee shops, and just being there as politicians. What we can do to help combat voter suppression right now is to be more informed, right? And oftentimes mm -hmm. that information lies with your local municipal clerk, or you can get involved with an organization in your community, right? That will help inform you about when you can request your ballot from the government if you are are allowed to do mail-in ballots, when early voting begins in person, um, what documents you need to bring, because every state is different in, in terms of their laws, right? What you need in Wisconsin to go vote is different than Texas. Tough University did an analysis that found that youth voter turnout was highest uh, at 57 percent and had the largest increases over 2016 in states that automatically mailed ballots to voters. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I moved. Shocking. Are Shocking. You, yeah, are you telling me that, that they make it voting easy, it more people accessible? will do it? People Who would have thunk it? <laughs> Who would have <laughs> thunk? But, but, there's a, but there's a caveat to that, yeah. right? Because once everybody's mailed a ballot, okay, do they recognize the names on that ballot? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we begin to teach people about who's on the ballot and some of these obtuse positions that are very important, but not as, you know, sexy as uh, some of those people at the top of the ballot. One of the groups on our network, Chicago Votes, does this amazing program, Unlock Civics, that literally mm -hmm. goes inside a Cook County jail mm -hmm. um, to register voters, right? Because they haven't been charged with the crime yet. They still have the right to vote, right? And so they go in every week to go register those folks, and they run civics classes inside a Cook County jail, right? Mm -hmm. It is like the only program in the nation like this. It's like, well, we have all these folks in, in jail in this country because we over-incarcerate, right? Mm -hmm. We especially over-incarcerate black folks in this country, and yet no one's doing the work to ensure that like they can continue to remain civically engaged, to be informed about stuff that's on the ballot. Because it's often these judges who are the ones who have the discretion on the sentencing as well, too. Judges are so important, especially the elected ones in our system that like never get any attention, right? There are also some great bodies that do um Bar, different bar associations mm -hmm. and yep. different affinity groups that make sure that they rate the different judges and who mm -hmm. we should be voting for. Those typically help. I think what I love about what you do as well, Sophia, is when you pick a specific issue, when you decide to automate uh, a strategic response to that issue, it kind of in turn educates us about some of the issues mm -hmm. that we care most about. Uh, Let's talk a bit about what those issues are that are on the ballot that young folks care about. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the largest obviously being abortion. Like after the fall of Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision, I think a lot of people realize that you really got to look out for yourself. You got to look out for your community, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the way that we can do that with this election in particular is, of course, in federal, but also attorney generals. Um, mm -hmm. I think that we've seen a lot of messaging specifically about attorney generals and their ability to choose to prosecute or not yep. prosecute in states that have abortion bans. These individual smaller, like you said, less sexy positions mm -hmm. are oftentimes the ones that are making the decisions. There's so many 
decisions that are reaching the Supreme Court that will fundamentally change the lives and life expectancies and quality of life mm -hmm. for so many marginalized groups within this country. And I think it's a matter of ensuring that the people that we are electing are going to ensure that the Supreme Court also works for us as well. Hmm. Other issues that you are focused on right now that's important for you on the ballot? Yeah, I mean, voting rights, I think, is one of the most important issues right now anywhere in the country because it, it is the issue that unlocks all the issues. Mm -hmm. We can't take action on climate justice without voting rights because we have folks in office who do not feel like they are accountable to the people that elected them. Yeah. They do not feel like they have to go into the communities with folks that do not vote for them and listen to their concerns, even if these are massively popular policies, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's critical that we're electing pro-voter candidates, people who actually are willing to invest in our democracy. And I, I always say, too, that goes beyond just policies, right? I want to see how you're running campaigns. Come on now. Are you only going to talk to people that you think are going to show up? That, right. Like they've run campaigns forever? Or are you actually getting out there and creating a new electorate? I, I'm thinking about LGBTQ rights, too. I didn't even realize that the past two years was a record-breaking time period for mm -hmm. anti-LGBTQ yeah. plus laws. Yep. Uh, 290 bills were proposed, yeah. about 25 of those passed. Um, do you think that's on the ballot as well? Absolutely. I yeah. think that especially like looking at, um, I think it's Florida's? Yeah, Florida. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's like there's <sighs> so many places that are starting to um, utilize like the lack of people voting, but the lack of people engaged, really, mm -hmm. um, to their advantage to be able to take away a lot of our rights um, that are supposed to be, you know, said in the Constitution. With all of these issues going on, like LGBTQ plus rights, um, climate change, racial justice, all of those things, it's like, we just need to be able to tell people that they have a voice and that they have yep. power. Let's talk a bit about climate change, too. Yeah. It's something that you have been organizing around. At like first, it was young people are really caring about the mm -hmm. climate, but research is showing that it's a broad across several different right. voting blocks. Do you think it's on the ballot this year? Absolutely. I think the increase of hurricanes is one of the biggest thing people see, and it's ah, because mm -hmm. of climate change, right? Like, we see how devastated states like Florida are becoming, mm -hmm. how Puerto Rico is constantly being hit. And I think that more people are caring because it's impacting them more. Mm -hmm. And at sooner or later, it's going to start impacting all of us. We talked about abortion. We talked about climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about these Supreme Court decisions coming down that are going to affect the welfare, health care of a lot of folks. The problem with talking about a lot of these things is that human rights has become a partisan issue, which yeah. is part of the issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can you champion these issues without alienating some voters? I mean, I mean unfortunately, I don't think so, right? I think this all goes back into this country's founding of being an imperialistic, colonialistic country, right, mm -hmm. that had to literally commit genocide to wipe off a group of people, right? And then bring another group of people in for a labor force, help build this country. And what was founded was a country that was meant for white male land-owning individuals, right, mm -hmm. at, the, at the top. And now we're saying, we're, we're, we're essentially not only trying to reimagine democracy, but reimagining what this country could be. And I think what we're seeing is an intersectional movement of young people who are saying, we're not just one issue voters, we care about abortion, we care about the environment, we care about the economy. We, mm -hmm. we are literally pushing the gas pedal on social change mm -hmm. faster than some people are comfortable with, right? Yeah. There's a lot of people in this country who think, oh no, if racial justice is achieved, then I'm going to, my life as a white person is going to be worse. Mm -hmm. And I think by perpetuating those lies and having so many people believe mm -hmm. them and having them be so widespread, that is the only reason why these basic human rights rights issues end up being contentious. And I feel like if you are concerned that human rights do not pull well for you, don't run for office. Exactly. <laughs> I am not I am not interested in you being an elected official in this That's country, right? And bar. so much of these conversations that we have with candidates are trying to convince them to like say what they actually believe, mm -hmm. to actually show up and believe something. And mm -hmm. right. they do have these conversations where they're like, oh, well, I don't know if people are going to show up if we talk about this issue. And I'm like, if you believe it, there are people that believe it, too. Yeah. I think additionally that requires us, the electorate, to just like be comfortable with getting angry and getting loud, right? Yeah, yep. Because yeah. we saw this in Arizona as well. Like After Roe had fallen, there were candidates who were like, well, maybe I wouldn't actually ban abortion because it's not popular amongst yeah. the electorate. And it's a matter of said electorate being very vocal mm -hmm. about what exactly matters to them. Yeah. The, the media of America does not 
incentivize like revolts, right? Like mm-hmm. the last time America had something similar to a revolution or a revolt on a mass scale was probably the Wall Street movement, right? Where people mm-hmm. were, were taking over streets in Wall Street. And like there is such a coordinated media effort to say that is not how you're supposed to do it, right? Like we've rewritten the entire history of Martin Luther King mm-hmm. to say that he was like this like just this peaceful person who like never got angry, right? right? And actually to your point, like we need to get angry and we need mm-hmm. to really take the streets if we wanna see action, right? Like that's yeah. what every other country does. We don't necessarily have that same, um, that same energy in America yeah. and I think that's a lot due to how civic education is taught or yeah. not mm-hmm. taught. You talked about mainstream media and yeah. how they preface these conversations, how they got in these conversations and how they kind of sway the electorate in thinking a certain way about an issue. Like, I mean, when you look at the the horse races that we watch, yeah. this is happening here, this is happening, this candidate failed because he d- wasn't moderate enough yeah. in mm-hmm. an area they love Texas. saying that. So what role does media play in making us feel like progress is attainable in some of these regions where regressive yeah. candidates are successful? You know, so much of the coverage just gets down to the, the horse race nature of it, mm-hmm. right? I feel like so much of what we only ever hear about an election is what the poll numbers are. Mm-hmm. I'm not a poll number, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm a voter with autonomy who shows up for the values that I believe in. And when we reduce people to these numbers, they don't see themselves reflected in that media. They don't see themselves as part of that electorate. And I think we have to do a lot more to really humanize what these elections mean, what the impact of these elections mean, right? And when we, uh, it frustrates me to no end, right, when a big bill will pass in Washington and they'll say, oh, this was a big win for this party. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what did that bill do? That bill is impacting people's lives. Yeah, I mean, also, like, what even is in those bills, right? Like, (laughs) nobody is going to congress.gov and reading the bill because who can read that language? It's not accessible. (laughs) And the role of the media should be to make that kind of information accessible. And it's also, like, people don't watch local news as much as they do the national news. I think it's also so difficult to know who's running for office when you see these two polarizing candidates on your screen all the time, Mm -hmm. especially in these swing states, because that's all they care about are these swing states. creates a fantasy and the the viewer has nothing but to do but believe it because it's what you're being fed to on every single channel that you go to. I mean, media is driven by profits, right? Like mm-hmm. people are trying to sell ad time to make the most profits mm-hmm. for the owner, the shareholders. Mm-hmm. And so what the content they're putting out to us is like fear. Because if we just present everything as good, who's gonna watch the news, right? Chaos, just like, chaos right. sells, yeah. And, and, and that's, I think, where the media gets it wrong, because like, how often can you turn on even your local news and see a positive story about young people mm-hmm. compared yeah. to yeah. them talking about them negatively, right? Like, young people do something great every single day, but we tend to only hear about young people in the media when they do something bad. How do you think we address some of that and, and work to communicate more of those wins? I feel like we have to do a better job of like highlighting what the real impact of activism is, mm-hmm. right? And like what, because again, we get into this like, bill passes, bill doesn't pass, right? That's wins and losses. And I can just tell you like in Texas, anti-voter lawmakers control basically every level of government. If they wanna pass their voter suppression bill, they're gonna pass their voter suppression bill. That's the reality, the political reality in Texas right now. And our job was to protect as many people as possible in that process, right? And so hundreds of people turned out to the Capitol again and again and again. Every time there was an election hearing in Texas last year, they ended up lasting more than 24 hours because so many people showed up and demanded to speak their two minutes that they would push these things. And that matters. Yes, that bill passed, but in the final version, it looked nothing like the original version of that bill, which would have made it easier to overturn elections. (laughs) <laughs> that, that was in there, right? It had more barriers on voting by mail, had those reductions in early voting hours. None of those things passed because so many people showed up and shared their stories, right? And we don't, we don't tell that story enough. And we need to because I need those people to show up next year too. Yeah, yeah. So even in the midst of what's being categorized as a loss, there are these wins. Yes, mm-hmm. every single day. showed up. Every single day they weren't able to pass that bill because so many people showed up. That was a win. Mm -hmm. right because it meant one of their other priorities got knocked off the table how do we use social media as one of those levers that we can pull to close the misinformation yeah. <laughs> gap that we're getting from mainstream media and how they're covering politics? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a double-edged sword because social media does have a very big amount of disinformation. There is a, 
like white supremacist pipelines on the internet that yes. people can just like go down this rabbit hole. So mm -hmm. there's and that it's side like of scarily social. easy. Oh, it's so yeah. easy. Yeah. Like there's multiple people who have done like these case studies where it's like it only takes like four or five like videos and then mm -hmm. they're just in there. But the other side of that is being able to democratize information. Because I feel like a lot of the time, like the, like the, new, the mainstream media has their own agenda, they're doing their own thing. I, like for example, like I make content on literally whatever I want, I just let my thoughts out into the world. Um, but oftentimes it is to relay information that otherwise would not have been accessible to yeah. people. Um, and I think that's what's great about organizations like Gen Z for Change is that like we're trying to bridge the gap between these oftentimes convoluted concepts, these convoluted means of participation and making them simpler. Mm -hmm. um, whether that be through like getting rid of tip lines or having, like we, like there's a time that we went to DC and we just made a bunch of random TikToks with like different people in Congress that people would know who exactly is representing them um, and what they stand mm -hmm. for with this upcoming election. Also like doing things like phone banks and stuff and organizing them in a way where it's like, come bring your homies and like we can like, I don't know, like have like some special guest on it or something to encourage people to get civically engaged as well. And so if we're able to relay that information, I think that that makes for a less hopeless <laughs> a future yeah. and generation because it can be really hard to just try to figure the whole thing out while also doing school and having this negative feedback loop in the news. Like we wanna be able to streamline information, make the process easier, and then also like do it in a way that is the language that we speak as yeah. our generation, like not making it like, like Isra was saying, like these super long documents that have all this like crazy legal jargon that are like, what's happening? Like we need someone to just tell it like it is. Yeah. And like, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. You know, thinking about not only the social media, how it affects the mental health of everybody who's using it, yeah. but specifically as activists yourselves and people who engage not just on social media, but in real life, how do you maintain your sanity. Lexapro. Yeah. Doing this. <laughs> <laughs> doing this work. <laughs> you know, seriously, like what what are some of like yeah. how are you how are you Honestly, keeping your mental straight? As a young person who like used uh, used to I guess I still do, but used to post my political opinions and public discourse on Twitter, TikTok and Instagram. I honestly had to take a break. Like it mm -hmm. is mentally draining to hear um, like to tell people that they want you to die or that you mm -hmm. deserve, like that you're not intelligible or all of these mm -hmm. things or tell you that your opinions don't matter because of your age. It's, it's difficult because it's like you have to put it through like such a clear lens so that you don't get like mass harassed, yeah. if you know yeah. what I mean. Like there's very polarizing words and language that if you use them, like the world will turn against you. Yeah. So I think it's just learning how social media really functions and how you will be and inevitably perceived, I think, is the best way to really continue to post um, political content or even content um, about issues in, at all. Um, but also knowing when to take a step back and knowing that social media is a very powerful tool, but it also isn't the only tool and that you can, um, like, if one gets overwhelming, you can do the other and vice versa. There's this confidence that you have that I find so admirable, unique, especially you. that it came, you being super young because when you're sharing these issues and the way you share them, certain tropes and stereotypes get placed upon you. Mm -hmm. The angry black girl stereotype, yeah. the angry black man. If I'm, if I'm using, there's a certain voice that I use even when I'm presenting. If I say it too forcefully, too strongly sometimes, right. they don't hear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It might sound differently when Charlie says mm -hmm. something versus when I say it. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine having to be cognizant of that reality as early as elementary school yeah. and taking that trope and spinning it on his head and saying, no, I'm that angry black girl because I deserve to be angry. It reminds right. me of that Solange song where she was like, I got a right to be mad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you find that and what advice would you give mm -hmm. to other young activists and organizers who are dealing with that vitriol that they receive online and who have questioned their own value as a result of all of the negative stuff that they see? Yeah, honestly, first I would like to thank my parents. They really raised me to be a very confident person in myself and my beliefs um, to the point where I felt comfortable calling people out as early as elementary school when I heard some BS being said to me. Um, but honestly, I think that it was also just experiencing being in white spaces for a really long period of time. I started organizing in climate at 14, um, and really I was the only black person in the room every single time. And the amount of times I felt tokenized or I was told I was being too loud or too aggressive honestly got to me. Um, but then I started realizing that it didn't matter and that people 
people valued my voice and I realized that like a lot of people were also looking up to me. I would get messages from kids way younger than me talking to me about how helpful it was to have somebody who looked like me in this space. I think really gave me more of a confidence to be like, screw you, you know, like I, I do deserve to be angry and I've been angry my entire life because of the reality of this world and so many other people are angry because how can you exist and not be? Um, and so I think that it's just, um, easier honestly to reclaim it because I I know that like you can tell me whatever you want to tell me but I like I know my own truth um, and that um, being angry isn't a bad thing um, if anything it is a powerful tool Dakota can you give us a final thought on this mental health piece how are you managing your mental health and the mental yeah. health of the organizers that you are mentoring I mean like one like you have to recognize that it there is a sacrifice um, to be involved in some of this work, right? That mm -hmm. to speak up about issues that you care about. Like I personally have received like literally physical like hate mail. Like mm -hmm. somebody's like found my address, mailed stuff. You get mm -hmm. phone calls. You get you get the mm -hmm. comments on social media and all this other kind of stuff. To me, a community is really folks coming together to weave together their dreams for a common liberation, right? And mm -hmm. to have that. Um, is so important in this work. Like, you know, if you have, if you also have the resources, like find a good therapist, because like that, <laughs> sometimes you just need to go cry to a therapist some days. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it's about making sure that the organizers within my network have shared communities, right? To have the resources mm -hmm. to go out and have healthcare to go get therapists, to have learning communities where if you have a similar job as somebody and you live in Mississippi, you can connect to somebody in Oregon who has a similar job, who's going through the same stuff. So that way you don't feel as alone and isolated. Because I think when you're getting all this hate mail, these hate comments, to feel isolated mm. only makes it worse, right? What we often find is that when we get outside and we touch the people for real, mm -hmm. what they say is so different than what is being said online. Mm -hmm. It's like, you, so when, you, when you're out there and you're engaging community, what if some, and that's to, to everybody, what are some of the tactics that have been most effective for you in getting people energized around the issues that you care about? Like, Meeting them when they're at, I think. Yeah. It's really that simple, like treating people like humans who like deserve to be spoken with in the same compassion that you would expect yourself. Like I think just like if someone needs the extra education, give them that education. Yeah. Don't be snarky about it. Like yeah, just yeah. be able to literally relay what is necessary and then have them come to their own conclusions, which oftentimes are going to be the conclusions that you're probably looking for because if someone knows that something bad is happening that is actively affecting them in their community, also they're gonna be mad about it too. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of knowing it and then giving them the resources to like, I don't wanna say make happen, but like. To make happen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 If that's what it is, that's what it that's is. That's what it is. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the most effective tactics we see is really just talking to our friends and family mm -hmm. about what's going on. We are the best messengers to our community about what's at stake in this election, what's at stake every day in our communities, right? And we know the research now supports this, that you reaching out rather than a campaign, someone you've never heard from before, is 10 times more effective than that cold call. And I think that is one thing we can all commit to, right, ahead of an election. Yeah. Go through those, the, your contacts and say, okay, who do I think might need a little extra nudge this year, right? right. Like, right. can I shoot them a personal message and make sure that they're registered to vote, that they have access to a voter guide, that they know where their polling location is? You can be that trusted source for someone else, and there is so much empowerment in that. It's like one of the things that I love about this time of year is that people know that they can come to me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, people yeah. come out of the woodwork in October of election years. <laughs> people I spoke to all year. Yeah, uh, people October I haven't talked to since high school. <laughs> and they're like, hey, Charlie, quick question about my polling location. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I can Google this as well, but I will answer it for you, That's right? Fine, like, yeah. I will do that work because right. I know if you are taking that step to reach out to me, I, I can take that step to make sure that we get you the information that you need because you're going to do something with that. And hopefully you're going to share it with other folks too. And there's the, those ripple effects. People uh, underestimate that because I think like when we think yes. about organizers, we think about folks like you guys who have been mobilizing folks since... You learn how to talk. Y'all was six years old, like, don't vote. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and you don't realize that if you are just that voice within your family, yes. you too are an activist in your little sphere mm -hmm. uh, of influence. For you guys, though, with the, the scope of the work you do, what has been the, the biggest obstacle that you've had to overcome, the biggest impediment towards your fight, and how did you overcome some of those obstacles? 
you can pick one or several. I know it's like a long list. Yeah, like, <laughs> like what do I choose? Where do they begin? Where do they end? I think sometimes for myself, it's just like being young, black, indigenous, and a leader in often a lot of circles who, like, I could be in rooms where I could be 10 years older than the next person, or I could be 40 years younger than, like, the next person closest to my age. Like, there's a lot of, like, imposter syndrome, right? Mm. To, like, am I supposed to be here in this moment? Um, is this the right call for me to be a leader, um, to be an organizer, right? And I think often just like getting into my head sometimes has been the biggest barrier because like you're not taught at an early age being a, a person of color that like you can really succeed in mainstream society. Mm -hmm. um, and so like it's often like that, that internal battle, right? Like on, on top of like the governmental mm -hmm. battles as well too, like sometimes you just have to like get up um, to go be able to do something, right? And wonder, hmm, should this be me? Yeah. Am I qualified for this, right? And, and having those thoughts, right? Yeah. And I want to I want to see a generation of young, beautiful, black and brown people who don't have those thoughts, who like mm -hmm. know they are meant for this leadership, who don't have to self-doubt or second guess that yeah. Yeah. Um, because it's so ingrained in our society that yes, young, black, brown people can be successful at a very young age, right? And have that notoriety and have that respect like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanna see, right? And mm -hmm. so I think for me, it's like, that's like the barrier some days. It's like, wow, should I be doing this? There's this idea that we kind of forget that Martin Luther King and them and Mega Evers, all of these folks were very young when they were yeah. mobilizing and organizing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it, we look at those old pictures and we see, see the suits and all of that yeah. and we think, I'm like, wait, he was 25 there, yeah. mm -hmm. right? right? And so, as we feel like we're doing something beyond ourselves, we're really just following and working right in the steps of, uh, of the ancestors. And that's yeah. what gives me hope, mm -hmm. is totally. when I see how, how you guys are moving and who in, in our history it reminds me of. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know you, Charlie, and I guess everybody here, what, what gives you hope for the future? You know, <sighs> A lot, actually, despite <laughs> despite a lot of the things we talk about, there is so much room for hope. And I, I go back a lot to that voting rights fight in Texas yeah. last year that I think really changed my life and how I view politics and the role that everyday people can play. And there was one hearing in particular towards the end that, again, these all lasted 24 hours. And how that works is you show up at 6 a.m. and sign up and you sit there until they call your name wow. all day. And there, there was a couple there that had driven to Austin from Dallas about three hours, and they had their two young kids with them, too. And uh, this was a very, very long day. And we had this whole room of activists that were making sure these kids had coloring books to make sure they were getting snacks, make sure that the it wasn't all on the parents to take care of those kids mm -hmm. that day. Mm -hmm. And by the time the this couple testified, it was around 5 o'clock in the morning the next day. Those yeah. kids were in the sleep in the back of that hearing room. And the parents just wanted them to be there. They wanted to know when everything was on the line for our democracy that they showed up, that they were there and they spoke. They only get their two minutes, but they stayed all day to make sure that they could share their story. Yeah. That gives me hope. The people who show up even when it's difficult, that want to show their kids that they showed up when it was difficult, because that inspires a whole other generation to take action. And there's so much of that happening in all of our communities, and it's about finding that and uplifting it, shining a light on it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I'm definitely a product of that, I would yeah. say. Yeah. You were that kid. Me and my siblings were 100% that kid. I remember. Um, after Jamar Clark was murdered in Minneapolis, um, there was a massive protest at the Mall of America um, where we were basically kicked out and had to go to the airport. But my mom brought my sister in a stroller, my brother and I, I was like 10, 11 at the time. Um, and we went with that stroller and we went to the entirety of that protest. And if anything, it taught me that I, I have a place and I have um, power um, yeah. in, as a sixth grader. Um, and I think that that's like so Amazing. important that like parents are doing those things and I also, Something that gives me hope is my little sister. Um, uh, she asked me to go to the climate strike with me once a few years back. Um, she was like seven years old and asked me all of these questions and is engaged without me even prompting her. And yeah. I think that there is a growing um, like care for the world um, with these younger generations and people are interested and they want to do what they can. And I think that um, really like seeing those messages that I receive and hearing about all these other young black and brown kids who are seeing um, them finally seeing themselves, um, whether that be in office, in um, these activist spaces, outside, honestly, and even like 
coming from Minneapolis and seeing my community really show out for each other back in 2020 and still show out for each other to this day, whether that be through like volunteering, food drives and mutual aid, like people are really, um, they're coming together and larger than they did before. And that's really, really exciting. Yeah, I mean, for me, the hope is like understanding that the future truly is young, black, brown, and going to be amazing, right? Like, um, when I think about what's happening, like what happened in Mississippi, where a bunch of young brown and black people had to step up to make sure that there was water infrastructure this year, mm -hmm. right? And even last year, right? What young, what a young coalition of multi-generational organizing is doing in Florida to help rebuild there mm -hmm. after that hurricane. What young indigenous people are doing to help like seed the next wa waves of sovereignty fights um, mm -hmm. for indigenous people. Like that's, that like wakes me up every day to be like, all right, what can I do to help support not just folks in my age or you know younger than me, but really thinking about the next seven generations of young people because this is not going to be a fight that we win necessarily maybe in my lifetime because when I look at what my answers have to go through, like we've made a lot of progress Absolutely. Um, and we still have a long way to go. And so it's like, how do we make sure that what we do today make sure that the next generation and the generations after them are set up even better? I think that's a beautiful note to drop the mic on because it's time to get to work, man. You know, if, if there's one thing to take away, uh, at least for me personally, is that your voice matters and that in the sphere of influence, the area that you can affect, the talents that you have been given, you can still use those to impact the movement in whatever way that makes sense for you. So I just want to thank you guys for being here, for having this dialogue, for being transparent and open, for letting me peek into your mindsets, and for letting me pick your brain for all this time that we've been chatting, man. It was really a good time, man. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you guys for being here. I hope this conversation inspires everybody watching to get involved in a way that makes the most sense to you. And it's time for us to get to work. Get to work, man. You know? Let's get it. Let's get it.